Welcome to Comic-Con at Home 2021. This is the panel for The Walking Dead World Beyond. Um, before we get started, we should probably recap to let you know where we were at the end of season one so that uh, you'll know where we are going into season two. You're also going to get an exclusive first look at season two. Uh, but let's kind of lay out where we were. So we left Hope in a CRM helicopter alongside Elizabeth and Huck. Um, Iris and Felix had discovered Will in the woods. Silas nobly sacrificed himself to the CRM to help Elton and Percy get away. Um, this was an incredible first season. It introduced us to a brand new set of characters in the ever-expanded Walking Dead, Dead universe. Uh, and there's so much more to come in the second and final season of this uh, two-season arc of Walking Dead World Beyond. Um, so right now we're going to get a sneak peek of the new episodes and roll the thing! Dropping off shipping containers. Containers full of equipment from the campus colony, Omaha. Generators, computers. Some of it was covered in blood. Yeah, all of it was loaded up into trucks and driven off. Wait, wait, wait. Blood? Are you sure? I heard them call it a salvage mission. Said something about shipping messed up by a giant column that ran through. A few days later, they found me, took me in. I joined a hunting party to help out when I ran into you. Wait, you're saying that Omaha, that empties just ran through? I don't know who else to take it. How? How can it just be gone? Wait, wait my dad, is, is he There's okay? There's no reason to believe he's not okay. Same with Hope. I kicked a hornet's nest, asked too many questions. Must have made me and Romano targets. Does Sarah know the whole time? Why would they lie? I don't know. All I know is they want me dead. And I will be if they find me. There was your exclusive clip of the next season of Walking Dead World Beyond. Now let's meet the executive producers and cast. Uh, starting off, we have the Walking Dead Universe Chief Content Officer, Mr. Scott M. Gimple is here. Woo! Also, executive producer and showrunner, Matt Negretti, who I think by the flags in his background, is admitting that he does in fact work for the CRM. Uh, we also have cast members, Aaliyah Royale is joining us. <laughs> Alexa Monsor, Nico Tortorella. Annette Mahendru, Nicholas Cantu, Hal Cumston, Jelani Aladdin, Joe Holt, and Julia Ormond. Rounding out your 2021 Walking Dead World Beyond panel. Uh, let us begin right at the top with our Chief Content Officer, Scott M. Gimple. So when can fans expect to uh, jump into season two? I don't think that date's been announced yet. Yes, Walking Dead World Beyond season two premiere, October 3rd. Mark those calendars. Uh, then after that, 11, 11 o'clock, Talking Dead. Uh, so you got Walking Dead before, you got World Beyond, you got Talking Dead, all October 3rd, tune in. And then if you wanna watch it early, AMC Plus. Let's get into the important stuff. First of all, we are jumping into what will be the second and kind of, and, and the end of this, um, what was announced to be a two season arc for Walking Dead World Beyond. Um, so what can we expect as we go into this second and final season? You know, so much of this show is about like seeing different corners of the world and the different people that inhabit it. And this season, we're going to see, I'll say at least three very different distinct worlds that have 
all sorts of different characters and they have their own issues with one another and they also have their own place in the world. We, we sort of explain certain things that are going on that people might not have been aware of. So it's, uh, it's more discovery, really, of characters and of worlds. Uh, you know, when I think one of the really cool things about the show, in addition to really being, you know, a, a standalone series, you know, story in the Walking Dead universe is I really watch this show also for the clues that tie the whole universe together to start seeing the grout that fills in the gaps between all the shows, which I know are all in slightly different times uh, at the moment. But can you talk a little bit about this show kind of leaning into the crossover mythology of the CRM and how you see it kind of, you know, um, working together with the other shows? I mean, two words, more grout, lots more grout. Um, <laughs> Good. This, this season especially um, tells sort of like these in-between stories to some really big things that are happening in the universe that, that really do join it together. I mean, grout is not the most elegant stuff in the world, but not a bad analogy here. It really does fill in some story gaps or story knowledge that the audience doesn't have. And, you know, it, it actually gets more and more intense that way um, as, the, as the episodes go on. And, you know, there will be a moment where you know, specific to that, specific to that joining of the worlds or, or at least getting other information about the world. Um, yeah, there are some very big moments and some very big aspects to the season. <clears throat> Rick Grimes, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I had a little- I, No, no, I'm glad you said that. I oh, can I was say, just coughing, I was just clearing my throat. No, no. <laughs> okay. Not Rick Grimes. Okay, but, but, Grimes. but we are starting to see all of this begin to play out and come yeah. together with a goal. I mean, it seems like now that all of these have a very specific direction that they're all headed, even though we as the fans don't exactly know where that is yet. There, there's, a, there's a tapestry being woven here. And, and, you know, you look at Fear, which is many years before this. Right. And you look at Walking Dead that now is maybe a little ahead of this. Mm -hmm. And bigger things that are going on to the, in the universe, it all weaves together. And the, and the thing that I'm proud of between these shows and the work of the showrunners, the work of the casts, work of the writers and the crews, uh, is they're owning their own piece of it, but it serves the other pieces. Right. Um, and they're telling real stories with that raw material. So, um, Matt, uh, first, I first want to ask you about, you know, with the idea of, you know, knowing, hey, we're creating this like close ended two season storyline. Um, did that get, was that was that helpful in the sense that you really kind of knew exactly where it was going from from the beginning or how have you approached the story uh, differently because of that? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting, Chris, because, you know, when Scott and I first sat down to talk about the show, it's we always envisioned it as a closed ended series, you know, uh, you know, The Walking Dead. Um, you know, had, had been on for, for quite a bit and um, was, just, was still going strong and is, um, you know, but for us, it was really about, you know, how can we tell a, a shorter story that's a little more closed ended? And, um, and you know, so we, we talked, Scott and I talked a lot about where these characters would end. And, you know, as you work on anything um, creative, there's always a fluidity to it, which is, you know, <laughs> things change. Sometimes you discover things along the way, but you know, there are certain endings that Scott and I talked about, um, you know, a few, a few years back now that, you know, we've, we've stuck to now that, you know, season two has been completely mapped out and, you know, exactly where things are going. Um, you know, it's amazing how many of those uh, early, early concepts that Scott and I talked about, those endings um, held true. So, so it's always great to know your ending and kind of work to that. And uh, that was sort of, I think, the creatively the satisfying thing about about working towards an ending is that it's something that we planned out for a while first let's talk about these episodes and what can you tell us about the group that will has been with since he left the crm facility with leo right uh, you know well, what we can tell from that clip is you know they seem to be a group of potential new allies um you know i'll say that we're going to learn a lot more about who they are and where they come from and also i guess how they fit into the bigger picture um you know, I don't want to give too much away, but they're, I, th I think they're a different group than what we've seen before in the Walking Dead universe. And I'll say also that they have their own, uh, their own sort of unique relationship 
uh, with the CRM apart from our characters. So there's going to be a lot that we're going to be exploring there, and I'm excited for for people to check it out. You know, I've been I've been uh, nearby The Walking Dead for a decade now, and I've never heard a showrunner say the opposite. You know, I really want to give a lot away, so here's every storyline <laughs> in advance that I'm. Well, Scott, Scott is the master. I, I can't, I can't, uh, he, he knows how to skirt the questions, I think. Uh, My favorite Scott Gimple been... skirt is when you ask him something and he doesn't, he'll just go, eh, like, and that's it. <laughs> this is a I wall. have been saying nothing for a decade. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping storylines hidden in his head since uh, 2011. Um, but let's also, Matt, talk about that we saw new faces in that clip. Can we expect... Uh, to meet more new characters, who who are we going to meet this next season? Yeah, there's actually, uh, as the world is expanding on this show, uh, we just have this growing uh, cast of characters that I'm so excited uh, to have with us for season two. Um, you know, we have a few new series regulars uh, for season two. We have uh, Jelani Aladdin uh, joining us as a series regular as Will. Uh, we have uh, Joe Holt uh, coming on as a series regular as Leo. Uh, Ted Sutherland, who played Percy, is now back as a series regular. And uh, the amazing Natalie Gold, who uh, if you remember from those codas, she was that uh, she's playing Lila, sort of that duplicitous uh, scientist. Hey, hey. She's, she's, <laughs> she, she has her. She's working some angles. Let's put it. The man's like in love. Yeah, and, and she's in love. And, and and there's there's some chemistry there between uh, between her and Leo. Let's put it like. Is that a pun? Because they're scientists. Ah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Points to Julia Ormond. Um, yes. Let's. Uh, I want to. I want to start with Aaliyah as we're getting into because I, you know, I'd love to talk to the cast, figure out wh where your characters are at, you know, where where we're going. Um, so Aaliyah, Iris now has confirmation that the CRM cannot be trusted. So how do you think she's going to handle the fact that both her sister and her father are now helping an organization that? Her gut instinct is telling her not to trust, one that she was initially proud of. Like, where is she at with all that now? You know, I'll put it like this. She's not handling it well. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's definitely a lot to deal with, especially when, you know, your family is involved and you feel like you're the only one who can kind of see through the CRM and, and their games. Uh, but I think we're just going to see. Iris was bold last season when she decided to leave and was like, Come on, hope. Let's do it. And uh, she just builds on that leader mentality. Uh, it goes from, you know, uh, taking necessary risks to um, being just a little maybe like reckless and rebellious. But you know what? Uh, she's growing and uh, she's becoming a real fighter. And I love that. Yeah. And the one thing to keep in mind about this series is, you know, because we've watched two other series where everyone really knows what is out there in the world and how dangerous it is. You know, I, I feel like it's important to keep reminding people these characters really haven't experienced that just yet. So when you set off, it is a huge, huge deal. It is, yeah. It's uh, it, it started as um, one, wanting to get our father back and then also just being curious about the world. And uh, now that that innocence, that curiosity is a little bit gone and it's, it's more about um, having a purpose and uh, everyone's purpose is different. Some people, realize that they want to be a part of organizations or, or have like a purpose in there. And for Iris, she's realizing um, that's not her. <laughs> she's got other things to do. And uh, I can't wait for everybody to see it. Now, uh, shifting over to Alexa and sort of uh, talking about, about uh, hope. So in the process of finding their father, they discover some, I wouldn't say pretty concerning things uh, about the CRM. And now they're separated from one another. So Will this separation, do you think that separated, they will be as strong, stronger, worse off? How, how do you think they're going to fare not having each other as a team? I think the separation was a little bit necessary because now they're differentiating themselves and trying to grow into their own skin. So Iris is realizing who she really is and Hope is finding out that she's maybe not the person that she was before. In a way, they're kind of switching places. I feel like their mentalities are kind of, doing like a 180 um, in this season. But I, I think they're just as strong apart and they know that they're gonna be back together at some point. I don't think they're really worried about never seeing each other again. So Alexa, I mean, Hope is brilliant, obviously brilliant and a bit of a rule breaker, which, you know, when behind the walls of the community, 
uh, can cause some issues. But out in the world um, that's beyond the walls of the community, that actually can probably be kind of an asset. I mean, do you, do you feel that that will be useful for her uh, moving forward? Oh, 100%. I think she doesn't really know what she's capable of and slowly but surely she's realized and she's like, okay, wow, I'm a lot stronger and smarter than I thought to begin with. And I Iris mean, too. Someone uh, wants, wanted to ask both you and Aaliyah uh, on uh, social media at last of us, there's a T at the end, last of us or last of us <laughs> T. I don't know. Sometimes reading these, the, the, the handles, the social media handles are like trying to figure out a license plate. I think it's last of us T could be last of us. Um, but it's uh, many fans love the theory about Hope and Iris ending up as some sort of rivals in season two. What? What do you think about this theory? Do you think something like this is likely to happen? Uh, let's start with you, Alexa. Yes, I think you take sibling rivalry to a whole new level. <laughs> uh, wow. I, I feel like it would be likely to happen, and I definitely did see it going that way. But there's so many bumps in the road and these little things that they discover that it's like, I don't think they could ever hate each other or be against each other for at least that long. All right, Aaliyah, what do you think? I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think sibling rivalry is a great way to put it, you know? I mean, we're sisters. We're, we're going to be there for each other no matter what. But then there's <clears throat> moments uh, that are a little less together and a little bit more divided. Uh, but it's interesting to watch. <laughs> I'll say that. But we love each other so much. And <laughs> it's like, I love you too. <laughs> you do. It, 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 does, it definitely seems like there's that constant struggle between, listen, siblings have like their basic, their basic sort of rivalries, but, they, but the, those rivalries never supersede the kind of fundamental belief that they have, like we're a team, we're a family. Do you, do you, do you think we're getting into a territory where that might be challenged in some way? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's like you're, we're growing up. It's not even just about, uh, you know, family. It's also, you, there's these individual people who want more for themselves. The whole point of leaving the community was that we wanted more. Like, yes, again, to find dad, but also we had to become something or else we were never going to become anything if we stayed there. And um, as much as we love each other and we'll always have the bond that we had when we started our journey in season one, we have to become, we have to become the butterflies that we're supposed to be. And uh, it's not, it's not easy. No. And that, that is the, that is the, basically the enduring um, story of all of the walking dead shows is what happens when you, when people get dropped into extreme environments that they aren't used to, how do they react? Who do they become? And we're really getting to see that, uh, you know, from where y'all started and where you're going in season two. I'd love to ask Joe. Um, so Leo is uh, obviously going to be reunited with Hope after quite a journey. So can you tell us what's going on in Leo's mind? Uh, I think the whole uh, second season for a number of our characters and, and certainly my own uh, has to do with dealing with the this changing world and the way that your relationships change as people grow. Um, you know, he has uh, these two very intelligent, very strong-willed daughters um, who have left everything they knew and their safety uh, in some part, in large part, because of decisions he made. So he has to grapple with his own role in them endangering themselves. Um, and I think he has a constant battle of the needs of the few outweighing the needs of the many. And at what point does that uh, conflict with taking care of your family? Um, and I think the wonderful thing that I got to discover this year uh, were the similarities and the differences of Leo and his daughter. Uh, you can really see both of them in him and, uh, and there are things that he shares specifically with Hope and there are things he shares specifically with Iris. So that was really a joy to just try to discover uh, those things. But there's a lot of conflict, right? I mean, anytime uh, uh, teenagers start hitting their adult years, there's a desire to break off onto their own. There's a desire to have their own voice. And, uh, and you're talking about two incredibly uh, talented, intelligent young women. So, uh, you know, to some degree, he's going to have some conservative points of view, uh, whereas saving the world is concerned. Uh, and sometimes those are gonna bump up against the ideas of his, of his uh, daughters. And I guess hope is, is the one that we will see earlier 
um, and, and whether or not he ever sees Iris, we don't know, but um, it's definitely its own journey, right? The, the adversity breeds the character or, or the adversity makes you break. That's a really brilliant, that's an amazing way to put it too. And especially when you talk about characters that are a point in their lives where they start, you know, when you're around that age, you start to become who you are, but then, you know, but then factor in apocalypse on top of that. And then tr like a struggle for the future of humanity just raises the stakes to an infinite level. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure and, you know, the pressure either pressure creates diamonds and pressure breaks things apart. So you kind of see uh, what effect it has on all the characters. Uh, Jelani, first of all, congratulations on joining the cast as a series regular. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited. It's been so fun to play with everybody. They're so amazing. So at the end of season one, it's so wonderful to see you reunited with Felix and Iris, um, both of whom you presumed were dead. Uh, so right. what can we expect from Will as we as we get into season two? I mean, talk about discovery upon discovery upon discovery. I mean, to just meet these people that you literally thought didn't exist anymore and then have to kind of fill them in on your life and then understand where they're coming from. Um, I think that that Will is basically going through the struggle that we all went through with 2020. How do we survive, <laughs> period? You know, it's like, um, it's actually been really cool to be shooting this show um, amidst our pandemic struggles, amidst um, our revelations that we're having as a society, um, because that's exactly what Will is going through. And that's what his um, internal guiding compass is going through. Um, how do you survive and what do you live for? Um, and, and the love that he has with Felix is, um, is tested time and time again, as any love with anyone is, uh, when you're trying to work for it and when you want it to, to work and you want it to be successful. What are you excited for fans to see this this season? Obviously, it's oh, I mean, just to like just to just to um, unpack that character. I mean, I think that um, Matt and Scott uh, wrote a character that I think is so complex and so and so um, full of contradictions. Um, and it was really exciting as an actor to unpack all of that. And so I'm excited for audiences to see that um, and to see the places that will goes. So moving over to Nico, let's talk about um, Felix and Will and what a beautiful reunion. And I think somewhat unexpected. I don't think they expected to run into Will uh, in the middle of the woods, but they did at the end of season one. So can you talk about what Felix is thinking in this moment and moving forward, you know, after the reunion? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like seeing a ghost, right, in, in the forest. That reunion, uh, I think, was vital for both of them in that moment. Uh, where do we go from here? If the first season was really about the six of us getting from point A to point B, I think the second season is from C to Z, potentially even in a couple different languages and everything in between. There's just, there's so much that happens in this story. And I think uh, in this season specifically, and for, for Felix, you know, he was, he was just on this mission last year to take care of the people that, are in his family, are in his chosen family. And that doesn't go away. Um, now that Will's back in the picture, that family is bigger, there's more to lose. And that fight uh, is is just worth more at this point. Yeah, and of course, in true to Walking Dead Universe fashion, when, when characters get one thing, something else typically gets taken away and sort of watching one relationship come together. We've seen another one ripped apart between you and Huck, which is, I mean, I'm sure people understand the gravity of that relationship falling apart. And you have this fight at the end of last season and where does their relationship, how, is it possible to come back from this at this point? I mean, that is a great question, Chris. <laughs> I think, um, you know, just as actors too, Annette and I spent so much time um, on set together last year. And then there was this, you know, so much happened and this season's just been different, right? And uh, we didn't know that um, Huck was working against us until pretty close to the end of last season too. So it, it changed this relationship entirely. Is there hope? I think there's always hope. Uh, I like to believe there's always hope. Maybe that's just the type of person that I am, but um, we'll have to wait and see. 
when you say we didn't know, you mean you as an actor even didn't know? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, like you guys got the script and it was like, oh, damn. Yeah, oh, for sure. Exactly. Um, that was actually a great, that's actually a great question. Scott Gimple being the grout of the panel. Yes, grout. <laughs> okay. Grout, grout, grout. I like Grout Gimple. I like Grout Gimple a lot. Oh, I like no. Grout Gimple. Oh, God, Scott, I'm so sorry. Grout M. Gimple. I, this is it's good. It's you know, good. But I, I do, the, I was curious about that as, as an actor. Do you like to know too much about what's coming up in the scripts ahead? Does that affect how you play the character? Or are you able, if you did know that, or would you be able to push it out? Like, how do you how do you like to approach this? If I didn't know where the character was going, I think I would be okay. I like to think big picture, but but on the day, I don't think about any of that. It's pretty streamlined focused. Like, okay. if I know where it's going, I mean. TV just happens so fast too, and it changes so fast. I mean, by the time that we get one script to the time that we're actually shooting, there are revisions, Chris Hardwick. Lots, <laughs> lots of revisions. So I try not to even get too attached to storyline because just the nature of television, just it's, it's nonstop. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty crazy to think that, you know, like a standard movie takes a few months to shoot. You know, and that's well, like an hour and a half, hour 45. Right. It's like it's eight right. days. Yeah, eight days and like and like weeks to months to write too. Like things are just the turnaround is so fast. We're um, making a zombie movie every two weeks. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly what we're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's that's unusual now. You know, I mean, we're we're kind of doing something sort of an old fashioned way. You know, people, God bless, people get a lot more time. It's a different thing, and they do fewer episodes. This is like getting fired from a gun, and uh, that's what. It, yeah. And we all, and it makes us depend on each other that much more. From the writing to the acting to the crew. Yeah. I'd love to uh, talk to Annette and Julia now because obviously that was a that was a pretty substantial storyline that happened at the end of last season. Um, Instagram fan Nefario Cues, I'm just thinking that's how that's pronounced. Asks, um, what was your reaction when you found out your characters are related? can we expect for interactions between them in season two? So I guess let's start with the first part of that. Uh, and maybe let's start with uh, with you, Julia. Um, I knew at the beginning. I like as an actor to find out as much, uh, as just as much as possible. So that it just, I think I just feel like it helps me make bold, as bold a choice as it's possible to make. How, just how much um, Scott and Matt hold in their heads in terms of the whole universe and how it comes together. And there's the level of generosity that, you know, Matt has always had patience and time to sit down and talk through. I have hundreds of questions. I'm a pain in the ass in terms of just endless questions. Um, and he, it's just been phenomenal that he's sort of very patiently. And even if he knows that an idea of mine completely sucks, he says, that's really interesting. He does. <laughs> that's just what I'm and two minutes later, you realize he thinks that really sucked, but he never oh, says no. so. I just have to mull. I'm a moller. Oh, sweet. <laughs> that's that's exactly what I love okay. everything you bring to the table 50 minutes in to a company. So um, I just think, I think it's pretty amazing. Uh, and I think also, I really love. When, uh, when you go back and you look at the sort of original series of Walking Dead and you see things that happen, helicopters that fly through in the serum and how that then appears in Fear Walking Dead and it's kind of like, well, hang on a minute, how do these pieces come together? There are storyline pieces that are held off in a disciplined way, kind of right off until the last minute. I find it, I find it really quite, quite extraordinary. Um, and in terms of Jennifer, not Huck, please talk. Her real name is Jennifer. Yes. Um, sorry. Um, Huck. Um, Huck. You know, there, I think people have put it really brilliantly. I think Joe's talked about it really, you know, so talked about it really brilliantly in terms of adversity and pressure can do two different things. It can split you in two different directions. And that's part of the growing up journey that all of the kids are going through. It's a grow up story for everyone. And it's about time Elizabeth grew up. Um, 
but it's about their relationship. You find out what's behind the tension of their relationship more in this and what can be resolved and what can't. Uh, you know, that, that, that revealing Matt Negretti's tell of, oh, that's really interesting. Now everyone's gonna like, like if people I, don't, I can never use that word again. He said it was interesting. Oh God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I don't think he can even help it. It's just, his, it, it's so funny though, because it's he says it the same exact way every time. Interesting. Interesting. That's just, Interesting. That is kind of like, like it happens yeah. and you're like, I okay. I to go around the room do a Matt impersonation and then the grout <laughs> king, the kind of grout king to kid, but it's kind of like. You have to have the eyes look up. It's, oh, I oh, do, I, 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 I am an effort. I'm so glad you put his glasses, but it's the same, it sounds the same. <laughs> You're joining the 2021 roast of Matt Negretti. For no, no, we stand Matt Negretti. Okay, never a roast, never a roast. Yeah, I do remember one, uh, Melissa McBride looked at me once and she's like, Matt, you're a sphinx. <laughs> <laughs> just like, and I was just like, I had the straight face on. And so I, 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 I hold that with pride. So I, I like to think I'm still unreadable, but apparently not <laughs> exposed. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to talk to you in that now and ask that same question about um, uh, your reaction when you found out that Huck slash Jennifer was uh, the daughter of Elizabeth working for the CRM. Uh, how, did, how did that affect you? You know, I always marveled at what it would be like to have a famous mom or dad, and I've never imagined to be part of such a matriarchy. And you know, just all the all the doors it opens, all the parties that you can get into. So that was such a dream come true. And um, I was like, Matt, Scott, you have to stop because I don't know what I'm gonna do with myself once this is over. If you make, keep making all my dreams come true in this, in this. Um, uh, grouty world. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> it's going to be really rough. Uh, so yeah, I've been, it, it's been really, it's when I, when I found out that I'm related to the C, to the CRM, I was like, oh gosh, how am I going to dig myself out of that hole now after, you know, Tony and Percy and just, 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 just holding on to uh, Jennifer's flashbacks, I suppose, and how she's um, a soldier of light and justice, and uh, that's something to look forward to. And while we iron out our complex mother-daughter relationship in season two, so that's where I'm at. Well, and having seen flashbacks of that she will stand up for what she believes in and break rules when she feels like it's necessary, that actually gives me some hope for her as well. Yeah, yeah. She's always had her own uh, head on her shoulders, you know, amidst all the influences, the big, the big influences. Uh, she and, and she's left, you know, she's she's a, she's a Marine, but she's left that force right that organization and now she's joined another one is it because uh of you know her mom being there is it because we'll find out where she's at and who jennifer is now you know we've, we know her in her flashbacks and then who she was as huck uh for two years and now she's coming back to be jennifer and she's been affected by all these things that happened in the meantime. And, and, and I'm curious to see who she really is. Who is Jennifer Malik? Um, going back to Julia for, for a quick second. So Elizabeth, you know, so we've talked about the relationship between Jennifer slash Huck and Elizabeth, but let's just talk about Elizabeth herself for a second, being a bit of a puppeteer in this world and pulling the strings behind the scenes to make sure that, you know, the CRM very much stays on track, regardless of what the cost, clearly. I mean, do you think she believes that hope has truly come around to her way of thinking? Or is she aware that there might be ulterior motives at play? Well, um, I think that part of the dance is to bring them in in a way that's going to be effective for the future. Um, and I think that's a, it's a, you know, it's a big part of the story in terms of how, 
I think it's a big part of the story in terms of the, the level of risk that the relationship that the CRM sets up with the rest of the world in terms of, you know, a self-appointed epicenter of urgency and wrapped up in secrecy. That's a sort of one-way relationship that just doesn't frankly work for anybody outside of the CRM. So um, it's it's clearly going to be a challenge in terms of what's going to happen with, with bringing anybody in. Um, and how do you, what what are the levers that are used in terms of making sure that somebody toes the line or produces what you want them to produce? Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I think we have to wait and see how strong Elizabeth's spidey sense is. Nice. All right, um, Hal. Um, Silas, oh. got a pretty incredible Ooh. arc this first season and he really, you know, as all the characters do, but he particularly went through a lot between, um, you know, confronting his past and moving forward and having to deal with the fact that he might have hurt people, but then thankfully we found out that he did not. And so now that he's been taken prisoner by the CRM, where do you think he's headed? Do you think he's freed from his past and sort of looking, is he freed in some ways, even though he is now, basically going to be confined by the CRM? Where, where do you think he is? Um, well, Matt and Scott came to me at the end of season one. <clears throat> they said, look, this is going to be a sort of weird storyline, but just hear us out. And they told me that Salas was going to open an Italian restaurant in a CRM food court. Oh, that's oh, that's why you dress like this. <laughs> it's a story about a small business owner with a heart of gold. That's fantastic. <laughs> like, we're not going to need delicious food. Italian food and gelato in the apocalypse? Of course. I totally I see. I mean, yeah, he just saw a hole in the market and no. Uh, well, yeah, it's completely different because Silas is like not completely scared to do anything now. He's sort of okay with reacting, reacting to things the way he actually wants to and like, you know, snapping necks and cashing checks. Like it's time for Silas to step up <laughs> and give it a real, real go of things. But um, yeah, no, it's a lot more fun, I'd say, this season because I get to sort of just react to things how I would as opposed to Thales was sort of too scared to do anything. Now he's sort of just like, there's just all this character to delve into. I'm so, still yeah. laughing. I'm so sorry. I'm still laughing at, he saw a hole in the market. So he decided to, <laughs> I, I hope in season two, you have like a, like an, like a bad Italian, a welcome to Papa Silas's apostolips. Like, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like there's a, I don't know, Matt, if, you, if, if you've shot everything or not, but if that is not part of the storyline, am, am I about to get a hmm interesting? <laughs> Apostolips. Uh, that was, that was amazing. Apostolips. Oh, that's good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. that, that's. <laughs> yes. Take a bow. You may have, you may have that for the Walking Dead universe. <laughs> um, and then also uh, how Silas really connected with Iris last season. So, you know, what does this relationship mean to him? Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know what I can reveal, but obviously, like, Silas, like, loves Iris. Like, she was so incredibly nice to him when everyone else is the complete opposite of the community. Everyone was a real jerk to Silas, but he had this crew, so forever he's going to be in debt to, like, I don't know, he's going to be forever in debt to the crew. That makes sense. All right, now going over to Nicholas. Um we're speaking of the CRM mission overall. Uh, so Nicholas, Elton has clearly a very scientific and analytical brain, uh, which, you know, has benefits and sometimes drawbacks in a world where sometimes you just have to make quick decisions. And how do you feel like his gut is just, you know, like he obviously has a very strong brain. How do you feel about his gut? I think his gut has expanded and I don't mean he got fat. I mean, like he just like, he became like ballsy. Wait Papa Silas's apostolips open. Hey, maybe something happened oh, there. So good. They are was, this Elton became more ballsy on top of the hill on season uh, one, episode nine. He really changes. He kills his first empty. Uh, he has that uh, really, really inspiring talk with the ghost of Percy that he created in his own brain. So there comes like the analysis part of it, but he really changed from that point. And so I think in season two, you're going to see him explore uh, some of the darker morality choices that he can't just sit back and observe. He has to be a part of it now. And so you're going to see how his brain works that and how his gut expands and how he eats pasta. And it's going to be great. 
I'm so sorry y'all didn't get to experience Hall H. I really am. But uh, I really look forward to the next season. The first season was incredible, and I can't wait to see uh, where the next season goes uh, to wrap up World Beyond. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for being here. Everyone was great. I want to thank everyone for watching Virtual Comic Con at home. You, the fans, are the grout that truly holds uh, the entire Walking Dead universe together. So I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Just so you know, Walking Dead World Beyond returns uh, October 3rd to AMC at 10, 9 central, um, followed by an episode of Talking Dead at 11, 10 central. Uh, and if you want to see World Beyond early, you can catch it on AMC+. Plus. So go sign up for that if you're not. Um, to everyone else, thank you so much. Have a wonderful summer, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. We'll see you next <clears throat>